This month's episode of the QA is brought to you by Rainier Arms. Hey guys, my name is Dave Tim. Thank you very much for checking out this video. This is the May 2018 edition of the QA, and we are publishing this on Memorial Day, which is important to note that it is Memorial Day, and we should all take a moment to recognize and remember those who have fallen fighting for our freedoms. Memorial Day is about those who we have lost fighting wars, fighting for our country, fighting for our freedoms. Many of you watching probably have relatives or loved ones that have maybe lost their lives in battle. And for them, we are eternally grateful and we will truly never forget their sacrifice. So again, while many of you are enjoying a day off, partying, doing whatever, try to remember what Memorial Day is actually about. And it is to literally pay a memorial to those who have fought for our freedoms and unfortunately we're not able to come home. So we are thankful for those. Now, before we get into the QA, we do have to give a quick shout out to TriggerCon, which is July 26th through the 29th, 2018 in Bellevue, Washington. For those of you on the West Coast or in the Pacific Northwest, make sure you head on up to TriggerCon. It's gonna be a great event. There's gonna be tons of new products being showcased. I'm already kind of getting uh, some rumors and things like that of some cool new stuff that's in the works. So it's gonna be a great show. There's a range day, there's an industry day, and then of course there are two days open to the public, plus there are VIP and other events. It is just gonna be a great time. And if you're going and if you run into us, please make sure you stop and say hello. We love to say hi to our viewers and we would love to see you at TriggerCon July 26th through the 29th, 2018. More information can be found online by searching for TriggerCon. All right, let's get rocking and rolling into it. We have uh, about five questions that we're going to answer today. We did get a few more questions that we've answered in previous episodes. So some of the emails that we've gotten where it's talking about like LPVOs versus red dots. Uh, we actually talked about that in the April QA. So make sure you check out the April QA. Other questions that we've got, I've tried to answer in a comment or reply to the email. So let's get rocking and rolling. Our first one is from Toshio, comment on YouTube. Hey Dave, love the channel. Great job on tackling your well-being. Well, thank you. I have a uh, Tried to tackle my well-being by being a more nice and polite person. I'm assuming that's what you mean, because I don't know what else it could be. But anyways, I've been watching a lot of videos on the AR-15 gas buffer system in prep for my next build, which is planned to be a 10 and a half inch pistol with a carbine length gas system. Having a hard time deciding going adjustable gas block or to tune it by playing with buffer weight or both. Is it necessary to tune the system using both gas flow and buffer weight, or is one necessary? And if so, which is better? So good question. Talking kind of about gas system, I think that was a comment on a. Uh, the gas 101 video that we did a while ago. So ideally, if you're doing a 10 and a half inch with a carbine gas system, which is pretty common, uh, first things first, hopefully you buy a quality barrel that does not have an oversized gas port. So you're not dealing with a ton of excessive gas. Now, SBRs are gonna be higher pressure than other guns. It's just the nature of the beast with an SBR, they tend to open up that gas port to compensate for a shorter dwell time. So you're gonna have, you know, more people than not notice that their SBRs have more felt recoil than their 16 inch guns, their 14 and a half inch guns or whatever. Uh, so the question is, what should you do? Well, it kind of depends on the build. If you're thinking about doing suppressed or unsuppressed, then having an external adjustable gas block would be a great way to go because then you can reduce the gas when you're shooting suppressed, open the gas back up when you're not. And right now the gas block that I'm liking a lot, I have a review in the works, it's the uh, Seekin, Seekins Precision Adjustable Block and it has a lever on it. Uh, it's so far impressing me. I don't wanna, you know, 100% recommend it because my review is not complete, but the experience that I have with it so far is good. Uh, so I really do like that. So that's a good way to go. Uh, you could also tune it with a buffer, like with a 10 and a half inch carbine, I would probably start with like an H2 buffer and a good spring, or you could use a system like the Geisley 42. Uh, you know, that way you could have, you know, buffer weights that you can tune, plus their spring system is pretty good. So that's probably what I would do. Now, as far as which one's better, well, it kind of depends on what you have. You know, uh, in your situation, if you're starting from scratch with a build, I would look at, that gas block, like I said, and then, you know, get a good spring system and then you'd be good and you can have tunability to wherever you need it. But for those of you who already might have a system, it's not as easy to take off a gas block and put an adjustable on, especially if it's pinned and, and drilled to the barrel. So you may want to look at then using a buffer system, uh, you know, increase some weight, maybe a different spring system. Again, the Geisley 42 system has been impressing me. I use that in a few of my guns. I have it in a couple of my SBRs and it's working really well. Uh, alternatively, for other guns out there, the JP Silent Captured Spring System works really well. A lot of people really like that. And again, it gives you tunability. They have a variable mass system. They have different springs. So you get some tunability there. I'm running those in kind of my three gun rifles and I have it in one of my 16 inch guns. And I just really like that system. So there's some options there. But ultimately what it comes down to is you have to have energy 
enough energy to cycle the system. If you have too much energy, it, it's excessive. So we want to try to reduce that by either gas. Now, we're not really reducing the energy by adding a buffer. We're just kind of adding some more resistance, if you will. So uh, I can maybe go more into that in a future video, but I hope that kind of helps you get started. Uh, this one is from uh, Jarrett. I often see gear for guns that I want to try and how well I like it or if it makes sense for my needs. However, the cost of items, especially when you add them up together, makes me nervous about buying things that I may not really like or need. How do you go about deciding what new gear you buy and when you don't like it, where do you like to sell slash trade it? Oh my gosh, this is like my struggle. If you could see off camera, I have literally bins and bins and bins of my spring cleaning sale of stuff that I have bought that I've acquired in trades or whatever that I thought, oh, I'd like to try this and then I don't like it. That is the struggle of getting into any hobby. And the reality is it's, it's, a, it's a constant. So well, the good news is once you figure out what you like, then you like what you like and you can pretty much kind of stick to it. Now for me, my criteria is hopefully, is it going to work better than what I'm using now? That's something I want to keep in mind. And if it's not going to work better than what I'm using now, I shouldn't buy it. Additionally, uh, I'm personally trying to buy a lot less stuff, uh, but try to find some trusted reviews. Uh, it's tough because in the industry, there are a lot of companies out there that send stuff to guys like me, making videos, writing articles or whatever, and they send it to them. They, some of them are even getting paid for it. I'm not cool enough to get paid for it, but there are some content creators out there that literally get paid to make content about that product. So it's kind of like an infomercial. You're not gonna see a bad review because they're getting paid. They get to keep the stuff or whatever. Most of the stuff that I review, I get as a sample or a T&E and I return it. So I don't want that obligation. I don't want that commitment. I don't want that, that underwritten tone of like, hey, you better do whatever. Uh, because if I don't like something, I will tell you about it or I won't do the review and tell them, hey, you need to fix this or whatever. But Try to find some trusted sources, but honestly, the best way is to network. Uh, what I have found uh, for my students, I teach classes and uh, I go to a ton of different training events, but go to classes and try to network with people and try to you know, talk to people. Say, hey, I noticed you have this holster. How do you like it? Or hey, maybe would you mind if I run a couple of drills with that on break or talk to the instructor or talk to the range master or whatever it might be. But try to network and that's a great way to get some experience with different stuff so you hopefully don't have to commit. Uh, one of the things that I do, I'm like a scope guy, I really like scopes and things like that and a lot of my students are now you know, starting to get more into low power variable optics. So I try to have as much on hand and I try to tell people to bring as much to different classes and I say, hey, let's play musical rifles and get time behind every scope so you can see if you like it, if you don't like it, if you like how the eye relief is, the illumination, the reticle, whatever. And then hopefully you can make a better decision on what you want to buy, but it's tough. And the reality is I have boxes and boxes worth of stuff that I'll be selling. You are going to sell some of it as a loss. That's just the way it goes. Uh, as far as where to sell it, trade it, some of the forums and Facebook groups are great for that. And if you can try to find a focus group on that kind of thing, it works out better. So for example, if you have a SIG MPX part, try to sell that part in maybe a SIG MPX you know, owner's group or a forum, so that way you're dealing with the right audience. It wouldn't make much sense to be on your Remington 870 forum trying to sell this MPX part, taking a chance. Uh, so that's kind of one way. Otherwise, um, sometimes I just throw stuff on eBay and I just let the market, you know, kind of decide what the value is and uh, you have to pay fees and stuff like that, which kind of stinks. And obviously for serial numbered items and certain firearm stuff, you can't sell it there, but forums, the uh, larger forums, things like that, you know, Weapon Evolution, AR15.com, M4Carving.net, uh, and again, some of the Facebook groups are pages, you know, primary and secondary. Uh, Light Fighter, I, don't, I haven't been on Light Fighter in a while, but maybe then your state might have some focus groups too. So I hope that helps with that. All right, one more question here before we take our break. This one's from Martin. I've been thinking about getting my first suppressor. What are some good options for one suppressor, 308, 556, and 270? One suppressor, all three calibers. Well, that's a tough one because believe it or not, uh, 270, you know, that's a big round. There's a lot of pressure there that you might find that a lot of companies, it's not as easy to mount a suppressor or get a suppressor for that. So just off the top of my head, what I would say for that is look at something from Dead Air, uh, the Sandman series. If you wanted a suppressor to do it all, uh, that would probably be the one. Now, depending on what your barrel is threaded for, especially on your 270, uh, that was probably gonna be the biggest challenge. Most 308s and 556, there's industry standards for threads, things like that. You can get muzzle devices, but uh, make sure you get your 270 threaded for the appropriate muzzle device. But I really like the Dead Air Sandman series. I run it, uh, I run the Sandman L. I, I have a K, an L, and an S, so I kind of have all three. But uh, they're just great suppressors, and what's nice is they're all rated 
uh, for larger calibers, even bigger than the 270. So if you got like a Sandman, probably, uh, I don't know, if you wanted it to be quiet for all of them, maybe look at that L. It's not that much longer than the S. It's not that much heavier, but that L will suppress your 308 nice. It's a really quiet on a 5.56, and it'll handle that 270 nice. The downside is it is longer. It's a little bit heavier. But if you want something shorter, the Sandman S would be good because then it would work great on that 308 5.56. Now, it takes my 308 to less painful, but it's uh, still you know, not like Hollywood quiet or anything like that, but I still enjoy shooting it. I enjoy shooting it on my 5.56. I don't have a 270. But what's nice with that Sandman series then too is because they all take the same muzzle devices, if you got an L to start out with, and then in the future you bought a Sandman S, or maybe even a Sandman K that you're gonna put on a 5.56 gun, the muzzle devices are the same. Just make sure that you don't uh, change the cap size so you're not you know, having an issue there, but that would be a great platform that I would look at. So that's, that would be my recommendation. Before we move on and answer the rest of our questions, let's give a shout out to Rainier Arms and the Apex Club for sponsoring this episode of the QA. Now, Rainier Arms is cool enough that they sent me some stuff to send one lucky question asker. So what do we have? We have, I've got three hex mags to give away, plus some grip tape so you can put those on the mags. And we got some followers as well. So you can change the color of the followers. You can add uh, followers to your other mags. So we got kind of this Hex Mag prize pack from our sponsor, Rainier Arms, which is awesome. So thank you to Rainier Arms. Now, if you guys are not familiar with the Apex Club, do yourself a favor and check it out. If you like free ground shipping, discounts on all your stuff, plus exclusive availability and deals on all the hot, cool stuff, then you need to check out Rainier Arms for one low price of $79.99 a year. You basically get prime benefits from Rainier Arms. And if you guys don't know, Rainier Arms carries all the cool gear, all the cool new stuff, plus they get a ton of exclusive releases. So definitely worth it because you get free ground shipping on all of your orders, plus you get a discount. So that yearly fee for the Apex Club could easily pay for itself within your first couple of orders and you get all the cool stuff before anybody else. So again, check out the Apex Club from Rainier Arms for one low yearly price of $79.99, free ground shipping, exclusive deals, plus discounts, awesome, awesome stuff from our friends at Rainier Arms. And we thank them for sponsoring this month's episode with the Hex Mag prize pack. So one lucky question asker is gonna get all this stuff at the end of the show. So let's keep on moving on. Now we are with James. First of all, thank you for the great content. Love the show. Well, thank you. I really, really do appreciate it when people say kind things. It really means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Your opinion, chest rigs or plate carriers for training courses and maybe a plate recommendation. Yes, uh, chest rig or plate carrier. So first off, ask yourself what's realistic for you. Uh, for you know, If you're just a training enthusiast, you could probably get by with a ch uh, chest rig and there are tons of good quality products on the market. Blue Force Gear, Tactical Tailor. Uh, those are you know kind of my go-to good quality, professional level. If you wanted to save a little bit of money, you can get some of the imported stuff from some of the other brands. Keep in mind it is imported, the quality may not be as nice, but you know it might hold up just for casual training, things like that, and it save you a little bit of money. But a chest rig would be just fine. You could have a couple of mags, um, you could have a pistol mag, you can maybe have a trauma kit or whatever on your person, that'd be just fine for classes. However, keep in mind, just because you're going to a class, don't go out and spend a bunch of money on gear. Kind of, you know, this kind of ties to the question earlier. Don't go out and spend a bunch of money on gear because a lot of times what I see people come to class, they have all this gear and they realize it sucks. So they fight their gear, they hate the way it's set up, they wanna sell it right away and they wanna buy something else that they tried. So for training, reach out to that instructor and say, hey, I don't have a chest rig or whatever, can I borrow something? Do you have a loaner gear? Or go there and talk to other students and say, hey, can I try that on or whatever? So don't be afraid to just simply start out with belt pouches or even loading mags from your pockets to start out with before you invest a bunch of money in gear that you may not like. So with that, a plate carrier, uh, if you think you might need a plate, certainly can get a plate carrier. As far as recommendations, there are so many out there that you're just gonna have to kind of evaluate the pros and cons. Cheaper plates, like a steel plate, are gonna be heavier. Uh, they are gonna be cheaper, they're gonna be more readily available, but they are heavy and they're not as comfortable to wear. Whereas like a poly plate or a hybrid plate um, or even ceramic plates are gonna be more money, they'll be lighter weight. Uh, some of them are thicker, so they might be a little bit bulkier, but also they're gonna be more money. And again, for the patrol guys watching this, 
if you know like the cops and things like that, if you know you're always gonna be wearing soft body armor at work, you may wanna look at it in conjunction plate, which is a plate that goes over soft body armor. That would be lighter weight, it'd be thinner, might be more cost effective. So personally for me on patrol, I always wear soft body armor. So my plate carrier at work, I just have an in conjunction with plate. Uh, that's a little bit more comfortable to wear and not as heavy as a standalone plate. So great question. I wish I could give you a specific recommendation on that, but um, there's just so many plates out there that it's, it's tough to keep up. All right, this one is from Jordan. Uh, wish more people tuned into your channel, or your channel. Hey, I appreciate it. I hope so too. But your question is, what is the best way to clean the lens on an RMR? I have small specks on the lens that almost appear to be water spots that do not come off with a lens pen. This causes a starburst unless I dim the dot. I uh, love the setup and use on my on-duty G19 and I'd like to keep it perfect. Well, the nice thing with the RMR is that it is glass. So the best way that I personally clean my RMRs is I find some soft cotton swabs and then I'll put a small amount of glass cleaner on the swab. Never spray anything on the RMR. So I take that swab, I put a little bit of glass cleaner on uh, the swab. Well, let me back up. First off, I take an air blower and I try to blow off as much dust and grit on from the lens as possible. Because the last thing you want to do is take your swab and then be smearing dust and grit, you know, because you could scratch it. So first things first, blow it out with like a little camera blower. It almost kind of looks like a little bulb with a nozzle. Uh, you can get them at any camera video store. So you want to blow the lens out, get rid of any dust and grit, things like that. Then take the swab glass cleaning solution applied on the swab. We don't spray it on the lens because we don't want to run into the optic or into the electronics. So we spray it on the swab. And then I basically start in the center and I work my way out and I just gently clean that up. I'm not pressing too hard in case there is some grit or sand. I don't want to push that into the glass and scratch it. So real, real gentle with that swab and glass cleaning solution and then it should evaporate. You can follow up with additional swabs. Don't use like industrial swabs or anything like that. Try to find some really soft swabs that are 100% cotton and uh, just go slow and take your time. You should clean that RMR lens right up. Last question. This one is from Brian. What are your thoughts on clamp on models of gas blocks like the superlative arms? Uh, his question was on a gas block video where I recommended you know, drilling and pinning a gas block. The reality is a clamp on gas block, which for those of you guys that don't know, is basically a gas block that comes onto the barrel and then it has uh, two screws at the bottom that clamp onto the barrel. And truth be told, a clamp on gas block actually provides the tightest seal of the gas block to the barrel. Uh, JP, I was talking to one of their engineers and they did a bunch of testing and they found that the tightest seal from gas block to barrel is with a clamp on because the clamp literally clamps on around the barrel, tightening it up, making that nice tight seal versus a uh, pinned gas block, which kind of just pins at the bottom or a set screw, you still might have a gap on there. That clamp on allows for that gas block to truly clamp and wrap around the barrel really tight. So here's my caveat with clamp on gas blocks is oftentimes I see people do not secure the fasteners correctly. So therefore those fasteners can loosen up and then their gas block can go. Uh, so some people out there will secure those screws. Great. Otherwise, other people will use a sleeve retaining compound around the barrel to kind of help bond the gas block to the barrel. That's an option as well. Keep in mind, it might make removal very difficult in the future. So it is uh, something to consider. But a good clamp on gas block like the Superlative Arms uh, is a good option. JP, you know, et cetera, uh, Seekins, uh, SLR. There's a ton of them that make good quality clamp on gas blocks. Just make sure that you secure those screws with the appropriate thread locking compound. They're degreased, they're prepped, and then you keep an eye on them. A witness mark really works well as well because you can just take a quick glance and see if those screws are loosening up. So that's gonna do it for this episode. We had six questions that made it to the show. A few others we did reply via email or comments because they were kind of repetitive. So now we're gonna give away our Hexmag prize pack from Rainier Arms. We're gonna randomly generate a number one through six, and that is number two, which means Mr. Jarrett Moses, uh, who was asking about gear, gets this Hex Mag pack. So right now, Jared, you get to try some Hex Mags for free, so no obligation. I'll reach out to you, I got your email address. Thank you guys very much for watching. Please, please, please send your questions to the email address shown below. That is the QA at gunsandtactics.com so your question can appear or you can leave a comment below. But the email works great because we can track it. We have your contact info. So please, please, please share the video. Get it out, tell people about it. We want the channel to grow. We want uh, our knowledge to be shared. We want your comments to be heard. We want your questions to be answered, so please share. Also, make sure you're following us online on all of our various social media outlets. Plus, you're checking out the webpage, gunsandtactics.com, to stay up to date. We do news, we do articles, we have reviews, all sorts of cool stuff. Online, social media. Thank you guys very much for watching, and have a great day.